from the new recording lair located deep beneath the Wine and Spirit Store in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. You're listening to the Masonic Light Podcast. Studio 665 presents Masonic Light Podcast. This show is recorded by Masons, for Masons, and is for entertainment purposes only. And please, no wagering. This podcast is not endorsed by any Grand Lodge, and the ridiculous ramblings of the hosts are their own. And now, here's your host. Hey, welcome everybody to episode number 72 of Masonic Light Podcast. 72. Hmm? And in case you're wondering, Larry's still with us. Yes, I am. There's, Actually, al- there's yeah. always some questions. And, you know, the time's going to be coming here shortly when the number of episodes are going to equal my age, and it isn't yet. So when we have episode 75, are we going to have to have a special show? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, hey, everybody. Uh, we got uh, two guests. We have a special guest in, in, in the studio tonight, Brother Ed Stump. Let's say hello, Ed. Hello, Jack. Thanks for inviting me. I do have a question. Though. I'm not Jack, but oh, but Pete, I'm sorry. I do, <laughs> right. I do have a question. And that's the way the show's gonna go tonight, yeah, folks. Yeah. Uh, if this is the 72nd episode, how come it took me so long to be invited to talk to? You? <laughs> I mean, 71 episodes before me. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't pick people in the order of importance. We picked them in the just the ones that said yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. That okay. Acceptable. <laughs> and remember, we did ask you several times, but you were sick or you had a conflict or. That that's that's true, Larry. I, I had yeah. forgot that. That's true. Yeah. And the one time, one time there was a, a threat of bad weather, so Larry canceled it, and turns out it was perfectly fine out. Um, and Ed lives closer than us. So yes. It's like, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, just so you know, a little bit about. And if we uh, well, I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I don't want to mess this up. So, so anyway. what we got? What we usually do here, Ed? We kind of go around a table and briefly, in case any of us have done anything really exciting masonically, um, we just kind of talk about our past couple of weeks. So, uh, producer Josh, have you done anything exciting? I don't remember. All righty. <laughs> Um, joining us in the studio today is also an, uh, one of our observers. He's like a NATO observer. Um, <laughs> Brother Dan Messimer, welcome. Thank you, Pete. And um, so, yeah, Dan, you're a, a relatively new Mason. Um, some really smart guys had their names on your petition as your first and second line signer. I think that was myself and Larry. Right, right. So uh, well, how you liking the Freemasons so far? So far, so good. Okay. So far, so good. Okay, you're you're still with us. I I saw you. You bought a tuxedo, so they roped you in already. <laughs> ah, sucker! Eye contact. Almost instantly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome and uh, thanks for coming out. And hope right. hope we. Larry says you're uh, official. Pote- officially, he is going to be one of our sponsors. Well, yeah, he he's going to watch us to make sure he still wants oh, to yeah, put his name on it. Oh yeah, that's why he's here observing the night. <laughs> Uh, Jack, um, you've had some good stuff going on the past couple of weeks. Um, I did. What did I do? I, I thought you had a uh, really good <laughs> grotto meeting. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, two votes for a good grotto meeting. Larry is a holding out, but yeah. Uh, Josh, we, we did a ceremonial. We did. Um, we, had, we had a good crowd. We had a good, we had a good crowd, and we had a good ceremonial. We had a good new class. Um, Was it eight guys, eight men? There were, there were eight that took the ceremonial. Uh, one of them was a holdover. He had received a, a short form or something. short initiation, and then we uh, we had him do the whole ceremonial thing. May I interject? No, I'm sorry. Okay, please. <laughs> I'm going to tell you since December when we met at the General Sutter when you were installed as monarch. Yeah, we have not had a bad grotto meeting. They have been exceptional. They have been well, fantastic. Well, thank you, Larry. And the ceremonial we did on Sunday night was a new one, a new book, new way of, the, and it was fantastic. Yeah, it's we have to work out some kinks in this in the logistics of moving in and out, 
uh, of scenes and things, but it, it, was, it uh, was it was but yeah. Andy but Sterling Andy did, did a great, great job. He did. It yep. was a super yep. job. He really killed himself. Steffi did a great job being you know who. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know what? Like he really was funny. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He really he was. was funny yeah. as His Majesty. Yeah. But yeah. It, it's it's a pleasure to go to Grotto on Sundays once a month because it's 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 just fun being there. There's a lot of good stuff going on. So I'm going to tell you, kudos, doing a great job. Well, thanks. Um, what else did I do, Pete? Um, well, you may you well I guess no. That was your wife. You escort. <laughs> I escorted my wife. You escorted your wife who made chocolate for our junior senior escort, night for yeah. Tall Cedars. Yes, and uh, and when uh, who, who I guess it was uh, Ed that said at the end of the meeting. Is there anybody here who's not a tall seater? And I was the only person who raised his hand. So, and and a flurry of petitions just flew at the table. And it, was, it was kind of funny. It's well, like you're, everybody you're ob- was waiting to throw a petition at me. You know, we've 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 hired you for two years in a row, so now you're obligated. I know it's kind of why I'm still in Scottish right. <laughs> Josh, you raised your hand. What did you remember? Uh, I remembered that I joined Chapter 43. Yes. Yes, he did. That's, oh, that's right. That's what I remembered. Yeah, and um, we saw we read your petition in, in council, but just because of the way the calendar works, you probably won't get it till February of next year unless uh, we find a way. Because <laughs> <laughs> usually we do our council degrees February and March. Um, the <clears throat> Select Master Mason degree we're doing in April this year but you can't have that unless you had the Royal Master Mason, which you don't have. So maybe if we can take you like Wilkes-Barre or some other parts, the hinterlands of Pennsylvania, we can get you caught up. There you go. Fantastic. Then we'll never see him again in chapter. <laughs> so, yeah. I know how that works. Uh, Brother Ed, you have a busy uh, Masonic schedule. Have you done anything of note? Uh the only thing, it wasn't on my Masonic schedule, but uh, last week I was in Texas visiting my nephew, and I went to the Scottish Rite in Dallas. And uh, inside their building, they have a display from Audie Murphy. Oh, oh okay. awesome. And his family donated all his medals from World War II. Wow. And they had his uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. They had his certificate. They had uh, the book, The Hell and Back, which he wrote, which he made a movie based on his life. That he starred in. So, it was, yeah, he and he also started. And it was very really interesting to see that display with his picture, military uniform, uh, in a very prominent place in the Scottish Rite. It brings back uh, memories of other famous people who have belonged to our Masonic fraternity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Larry, have you done anything? Well, I, 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 well, I went to Grotto on Sunday and had a great time. And Tall Cedar. Did we talk about Tall Cedars yet? We have one well, briefly. Briefly. Tell tell everybody well, about I'm it because it, it sounds like I'm boasting. Again, why, if I did. well, yeah, you can. It wasn't even your meeting. It wasn't. That's right. I appoint good staff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Delegate. We had Tall Cedars, and this is one of the things where the wives really like to go to this. They look forward to it, and I think that's I think that's great to have an independent body where the wives are kind of so interested in doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really do enjoy it. Well, we had uh, we had Cedric the Entertainer. No, Tom LeBaw. I'm sorry, <laughs> Tom LeBaw last night. He They're was similar. He, he, yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. He dressed like Cedric, had different coats and hats and things like that. And uh, he actually did a program. And it was on the movie Casablanca, and it was fantastic. He had film strips, he had uh, slideshow. I mean, film he had strips everything. like that. Yeah. Film strips and over mimeograph the machines. Film strips. <laughs> <laughs> segments, is that a, is that a new movie? Segments from the actual movie. <laughs> Going to the talkies. Yeah, it's a new one. <laughs> but they made it black and white. Why did you do that? <laughs> It was, it was funny. Was, it was funny watching the video. You could tell Tom captured this video off an old VHS because yeah. I kept seeing this line of tracking. <laughs> yeah. I, have, yeah. I haven't seen tracking on a TV screen. But it was spectacular. The ladies loved it. Uh, the guys loved it, too, because that, for myself, that's probably my ultimate. Well, movie. I definitely need to go back and watch it again. I, I mean, I've, I've watched it. I've enjoyed it. You know, I just enjoyed, like, you know, Rick Blaine is like the Zen master of solitary drinking. Like, when he just, like, like I hate when, you know. When, so much drinking in that movie. You know, oh people, like, ask me, Pete, you know, like, what did you do last night? And, oh, I sat home and got drunk. Oh, is everything okay? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I'm able to do that. You know, I can I can talk to the the monkey on my back, and we get a lot of stuff sorted out. But yeah, that's so. But <laughs> but no, like he pointed out some things that I didn't. Some deeper layers about that movie, like yeah. when he was referring to, it's December 1941, and everybody in America is asleep. I have, of course, when I was a kid, I just, oh, they're sleeping because it's nighttime. Right. But he's really speaking of World War II and just kind of ignoring asleep, what's yeah. going on in Europe. So. But yeah. I think the next time I watch that movie, I almost have to have a cigar and a drink in my hand. Because... <laughs> <laughs> you should do that anyway, though, Ed. Come on. No, my, Stephanie and I actually rented it and watched it like three days ago. Oh, just, is that just, right? Just to be ready, you know, for it. And uh, I didn't remember how funny it was. The movie, it, you could easily call that a romantic comedy it, with Nazis. But it was, it was as bad as Nazis There's are. So they make all lines. movies better. But 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 uh, and and the one who had the best lines was um, the French uh, Claude the, Rains the cop the, uh, Claude yeah, Rains. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he every scene he was in, he he ended the scene. I was laughing out loud because he would like throw this dart and it would just it was it was brilliant. I'm uh, shocked. Really I'm shocked. Shocked. There's gambling in this establishment. <laughs> exactly. I say hand him a ten thousand dollar note. <laughs> So anyway, well done, Tom LeBaw, if you um, if you're listening to us. Well done, nice uh, Ed and Ken, and for Ed and Kenny junior both. And senior, Absolutely, uh, it's uh, a great night. Yeah, so we do something at Cedars called Junior Senior Night, and it's kind of nice as Grand Tall. I get to turn over the reins and let the uh, my number two and number three run the meeting, and it was you know from my point of view, it was nice to just come in and relax, shake some hands, sit down, eat dinner. Um, but they really knocked it out of the park. They did a, a spectacular job. So They did. They did. Very nice meeting. In their Very Rick nice Blaine meeting. costumes. Great meeting. Tell us about something that you were just installed in not too long ago. I'm thrice Rice. illustrious, yeah. thrice yeah. illustrious yeah. master of Goodwin Council number yeah. 19. Yeah. So you're, you're managing two op, uh, pendant bodies right now. Yes. Last year I was Tim. Last year I was Dim. Tim. Deputy illustrious master. Now I'm Tim. <laughs> Thrice illustrious master. They call him Tim. Tim. <laughs> the one now, I'm at the very bottom of the line in Scottish Rite. So it'd be like eight years if I'm lucky enough. But everybody's already told me if I make it to the top, they're never going to call me most wise master. <laughs> most snarky master? Is Maybe. Right they're going to have to change the name. So. All right. Well, anything else, Josh? No? All right. Let's take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk to Brother Ed Stum. Um, Ed does a lot of things, but. Uh, you know, his origins are were kind of a mystery, but Ooh. he's going to tell us, and it's very interesting and very Masonic. Why choose George J. Grove & Sons for your next home improvement project? At George J. Grove & Sons, we've built our reputation on quality and trust for more than 50 years. For planning, to materials, to installation, George J. Grove promises a home improvement experience second to none. Whether your goal is reducing energy costs, decreasing maintenance, updating curb appeal, or simply increasing the value of your home, the George J. Grove team will recommend and provide solutions that stand the test of time. Call 717-393-0859 for an estimate or visit us at georgejgrobe.com. Welcome back, and uh, our guest this evening is Ed Stum. And a little bit about Ed, just a little bit, because I want to get into a lot of details, because he's got one of those long, long Masonic resumes, and we, we, we even Ed requested we don't get into that. The printer ran out of ink. And, print. and we like that. We no like resume. That. No resume. But anyway, Ed is officially the Grand Tiler for the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Yes. And also, another title he has is the Grand Smoke. 
of Pennsylvania and the International Cigar uh, Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Is Hamburg, that, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And so I, he's duly elected twice as twice, Grand Smoke. Twice. The, the and less, yeah, but he held the election when he was the only one there. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, the fact well, that I gave everybody a lottery ticket might have had something to do with it <laughs> if they voted for me. The last time you had a campaign for it. Yes, I did. I had a campaign. There were they, people trying to change things around. It, it but cost you, me $21 in buying lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here tonight because we've been wanting to get you on the show for a long time. And you said something earlier about, you know, not being invited or you thought that maybe you got paid for this or <laughs> tell me. Well, what you... I <clears throat> in most shows when you're on the guests, you get paid. But knowing this must be an expensive operation, I thought this might be the one show where the guests are asked to pay <laughs> rather than receive a check. I thought at the end of the Larry, night, Larry I did might pay. get a bill. I might get a bill. Larry did pay for your ten dollar dinner, so that's, yes, uh, he did. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. If I known that, I would have. If I known that, Pete, I would order the steak. <laughs> It was uh, Pennsylvania Dutch sausage, by the way, just so you know. I was that pack of crackers, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, um, you've got a tremendous, very interesting story. You have spoken to uh, at lodges around this the state, and, and essentially you've got a story that I want you to tell us about your first experiences with Freemasonry, not necessarily as a Freemason, but maybe as a young person. Well— before I get into that, I would like to say this, that I really believe that the three words, faith, hope, and charity, and of charity, love is the most important. That stands for what we stand for. And <clears throat> the way the charity came into my life was in 1949, my father died. And uh, my mother, who had not worked, there was five children. My older sister had married. My oldest brother was in the Navy right after World War II, and that left three of us at home. Two Masonic brothers came to my mother and told her about a place up in Elizabethtown, a Masonic village at homes at that time, that they would help her out if she wanted to send the children there. Years later, my mother told me that that was the hardest decision she made. Uh, so my sister and I went up there in April, and then my brother came up in September 9th and 10th grade to go to Patton Trade School at that time. That was the first taste I had of the word charity slash love, that someone cared enough about me and showed their love to provide me with a home and take care of me. Uh, it wasn't easy. I'm not saying it was all, you know, candy and sugar and ice cream you're away from your family i had 42 brothers plus 26 sisters there was 71 of us up there at that time um uh, not 71 do the arithmetic i forgot but anyway uh <laughs> so anyway seven and, liberal and we arts, went to a public school so if you mess with me you had to mess with 41 other brother we were they called us the homesies but again it comes back to the fact of love and charity. And as it went through, my sister graduated, my brother graduated, and my mom asked to take me home. And I'll never forget that day. She came up, Mr. Trimmer was the house father, and she said, Mr. Trimmer, I'm going to take Eddie home. And we were allowed to go home uh, every other Sunday for a couple hours. And he said, well, that's fine, Mrs. Stum. You always bring him back, so just make sure he's back in time for supper. She said, no, I want Eddie to come home and live with us. And he smiled and he said, Eddie, go out and play. Let me talk to your mom. It was harder for my mother to bring me out of there than it was to put me in. <laughs> because the Grand Lodge had custodial rights to, to my life. Mm -hmm. So they, made, they actually did a check on her to make sure she had a good job, the home I was going to would be a good environment, and the whole thing would be good. So then I went home. The next part of my Masonic charity came was when I applied for to go to college. I borrowed money from the Grand Lodge to go to college. So they helped further my education. I had to pay it back interest-free, no time limit on it. And then the last part of it, 
was when in 1993, when my mother got sick at age 89, she went up to the nursing home. And then she passed away in, in December 1990. So from 1949 to 1993, the Masonic fraternity was there for my family. And she went up to Masonic Village. She went to Masonic Village, which and, is, which and she passed at the nurse passed away in the nursing home, yeah. which is where the children's unit is. Is good. I, again, I don't know what we call it anymore. We, it's, the it's children's Masonic home. children's they, home. Masonic yeah. children's Children, home. Masonic children's home. Okay. Yeah. Now the the only difference now is that uh, they're f- combined forty children, and we lived. The girls lived in a big stone building, and we lived in a big stone building like a half a mile away. Now they live in individual colleges, more like a home. And, and they're divided up according to sex and grades and that. And I don't mean this in a in a bad way, and I hope it's not misinterpreted. I went up there uh, not because my mother didn't love me, but I went up there, and most of the children was up there when I was there was up there because of financial reason. They did not have the public support system they have today. Yeah. It just wasn't available. Today, the children will help them out today, in my opinion, shows the true meaning of love and charity because these children, a lot of them, are from broken family. They're from, they don't, you know, mom and dad is not around and the grandparents got too old to take care of them. So again, we're showing these kids the meaning of love and that someone cares for them and someone is there for them and someone will to take care of them. And we're literally changing their status of life. Every now and then uh, in the Masonic uh, the Children's Facebook and in the Masonic booklet they send out that kids are going to college. Yeah. The amount of children that from the children's home that go to college, the percentage is unbelievable. Just not college, but any form of education, tech school, nursing school, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania pays for that. As long as they keep it passing. Now, Ed, did you have a did your family have a Masonic connection? How did those the brothers only, know to come to you? My my father and and, and brothers, uh, his uncles, they were in the Masonic Lodge. My father was in Concordia Lodge, Philadelphia, and uh, I've had the pleasure of going there and speaking and thanking them after I became a Mason. I would like to say this. Uh, the first day I went to enroll at college, and, you know, you go up to a table depending on the alphabet, and I had a letter from Grand Lodge. I don't know why I had it with me, but I had it with me saying that they would pay my tuition and that. When I went to register, the girl said, sir, you know, you need X amount of dollars, uh, and then I can assign you your, your classes and everything. I said, well, this is supposed to be paid, and I pulled out the letter, showed it to her, and uh she looked at it, and she said, I don't know what this means. So she called someone over, and he came over. And my mother had always told me, look for a square and compass, either a ring or a lapel pin. <laughs> sure enough, I looked at this guy. He had a square and compass on his lapel. And he read the letter, and he asked me, he said, why did you have this assistant from the Grand Lodge? And I told him, I said, well, I was raised at the children's home, and I borrowed money to go to college. And I said, I didn't bring no money. And she says, I owe money. And he looked at her. He said, I want you to flag his file, and under no way is he supposed to ever be questioned about his finances. He said, this letter is as good as gold. And he says, just process it as if everything is okay. Then he put his arms around me, and he said, son, as long as you're in school, my door is open to you. If you have any problems, scheduling, grades, anything, you come and see me. Now picture yourself being 18 years old. You're going to a strange school, a strange city, and you see that instant fellowship and that instant, again, love and charity. I keep coming back to those two words, but that's to me, is what this fraternity is all about. And I think sometimes we forget that. We forget to tell people what charity means. In the beginning of our fraternity, the workers who did the, the great cathedrals throughout the world, as they traveled, if they got hurt, they could have a hard time making a living because they were hurt. So the, the, the guild, the fraternity, took care of them. That's what the charity was all about. That's where it started. And 
when we say today that we have Masonic villages for retirement, we have children's home, Shrine Hospital, Tall Cedars with the MDA, this is what charity is all about. And, and I think if we get this message out to more people, that what we stand for, I think it would mean a great deal as far as helping bring in new members. I agree. I agree. And Ed, you've you've continued with the charity. I mean, well, obviously you, in everything Masonic you're in, but in in Musk in, in um, Tall Cedars, you are the MDA. You're uh, on the in, board now. Yeah, in, uh, I'm the uh, trustee for the MDA Foundation, where we raise to date we have raised uh, fifty five million dollars. Uh, given to research for MDA. And every money from the tall seeders goes into research. In the Scottish Rite, I was on the Children's Learning Center uh, for 13 years. I was chair of the board for five. So, and just like Shrine, anything we can do to help children, I mean, I, I cannot say no to. Uh, I just feel that's so important because nobody said no to me when my family needed it. So I, I think it's critically important uh, that we live by our oath and obligation and we take care of our, the, the needy and not just in our fraternity, but the needy in your neighborhood. If an older couple lives across from you, shovel their walk. Because I'm 77, I like someone to shovel my walk. <laughs> <laughs> well, pay it forward, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe if you shovel that walk, poor Diana wouldn't be rehabbing that arm. Mm. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to shovel and smoke a cigar at the same time. <laughs> All right, well, let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Brother Ed Stump. <laughs> at the historic Smithton Inn of Ephrata, Pennsylvania, we're pleased to serve the latest creations from Weathered Vineyard Winery, along with spirits from Thistle Finch Distillery in Lancaster, all to be experienced in the tasting room of a beautifully restored 18th century bed and breakfast. Cigars by DNS Cigar are available for your enjoyment in the courtyard. The historic Smithton Inn is convenient to Lancaster County's most interesting attractions. Just minutes from the Ephrata Cloister and the Green Dragon Farmer's Market, and a short drive can get you to charming Lidditz, thriving downtown Lancaster, as well as Hershey, Bird in Hand, and Intercourse, or Valley Forge and Gettysburg. Whether you're looking for a romantic getaway or an active vacation full of sightseeing and attractions, the historic Smithton Inn will be a welcoming oasis from everyday life, one that you'll want to visit again and again. Stop in and visit at 900 West Main Street in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, or check out our website at historicsmithtoninn.com, or simply call us at 717-733-6094. Just ask for Past Master Dave. This is Brother John D. Cook, District Deputy Grand Master, District 3. You are listening to Masonic Life Podcast. Hey, and we're back. Uh, Brother Ed, we were just having some uh, fun off, <laughs> off mic. So if you could tell a story, you told a story to me one time about, um, we'll leave which master, Grand Master it was, but one of our right worshipful past Grand Masters, and in your position as Grand Tyler you're kind of privy to some information. So tell, tell, tell us everybody about the story about uh, how he can get away from people. Well, <laughs> uh, my tour of Grand Tyler could end tonight. Uh. <laughs> no, we found out there's a process. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> there's a, uh, they all have a, uh, uh, a singer they let a aide know, who in my case, if I happen to be around, that in case somebody comes up to talk to them and are taking too much time and they want to move on to talk to other people, they give a, a single. They, you know, it could be tugging in the ear or rubbing an eyebrow, do something like that. And, uh, uh, you know, we're supposed to watch for that. Well, unfortunately, one time I was not really paying attention. I was talking to somebody, enjoying the function and everything and not paying attention. And I happened to glance back, and uh, and uh, and I had this death stare coming right at me, and he was like pulling his eyebrow out, telling me, you know, <laughs> "When are you coming over, Ed? Come on, get me away from this guy." But uh, it's all in good fun. I can honestly say, in 15 years as Grand Tyler, uh, that the the Grand Masters, when they visiting 
Lou Lodges, her Scottish Rite, her banquets and that, the greatest enjoyment they get is talking to the brothers because, unfortunately, there's many brothers who never go to Grand Lodge and don't go to uh, uh, quarterlies or annual. And the only time they get to meet a grandmaster or at other white worshipers is when there's a banquet or something. And... Uh, they want to talk to the grandmaster. They want to go up and, and talk to him and, and let him know what they think the fraternity is doing right or wrong. And, and the white worshipers, I can honestly say this, I have never met one that did not enjoy talking to the brothers. Uh, and this current grandmaster, he really enjoys it. He really, And he has a great sense of humor and... and uh, he does enjoy the brothers coming to talk to him. So, uh, what what are some of the uh, responsibilities of the Grand Tyler? I mean, those are, you know, we know what the Tyler does yeah. in well, theory, but what does the, what does the Grand Tyler? The aprons well, away. That's... Uh, as you know, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, we travel across the state state for our quarterly and also for the annual. My responsibility is to make sure that all what we call the Grand Lodge furnishing show up and is set up properly. That just doesn't mean the chair, but that means uh, the scoring compass, the columns, the flags, uh, the aprons for the visiting uh, brothers who come in, also the aprons for the right versables. Uh, I order all new aprons. I order all new, uh, any anything that needs, Grand Lodge needs for the operation of a, of a lodge, meaning I order. Every time a new Grand Master comes in, the one coming in in, in December, uh, Tom Gammon, his apron is already on order, and uh, the gr- current grandmaster, his past grandmaster apron's on order, so it should be here next month, so we have him already ahead of time. Uh, and see that the meeting starts. I work very closely with the director of, of uh, Richard Lister work, Larry Buzzard, to make sure everything is ready and set up in time, so when the, when the uh, grand party walks into the lodge room, that it is ready. When Larry's up at the east and he hits the gavel to raise everybody, everyone is in line and the lodge room is ready. Interesting, always changing. Uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And we've had some better attendance the past couple. I think you had told me that we had to fill a second room. The the last two installations in Corley, they have really increased attendance. I'm not sure if it's the... Uh, uh, Podcast. It's interest. our podcast that's doing it. Just more interest. It, it could be the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I never thought of that. We do announce it. But there seems to be a larger attendance, uh, especially this last one in in Lancaster. We had a fan, we had to put a hundred extra chairs up. Uh, yeah, it was we, a scramble at, right at the just before the meeting yeah, started. It was, was, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, and whenever we have it outside of a Masonic building, we always have the staff of the hotel ready. So we they had a hundred extra chairs. So when we called them, they were ready to bring them in. Uh, you know, sometimes these chairs could be five floors away, but they had them right outside. So when I said I needed them, they brought them right in. So it, there's always some excitement. Larry, don't stare at me. Oh, of well, <laughs> you bring, you pack up a truck, right? I mean, you bring the altar, the chairs. Basically, right. you have a traveling Grand Lodge furniture. Traveling, it's stored in the, the Masonic Village at Elizabethtown. And when we travel, we take it, except when we go to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Masonic Center, they has their own furniture we use because they have lodges so to meet right there. It's kind of like coordinating a rock band show to go out to some stadium Ab- somewhere. Absolutely. Really Everything got to be set up. The carpet, the platform, since we went to open installations now, we have a raised platform in the middle of the room uh, so that when the grand ma- new grandmaster takes his oath that he's raised, everybody can see him. Uh, it, it's quite an operation. Uh, it has involved over the years since I started because of the open installation. Uh, it, it's interesting. It's uh, interesting. It takes a lot of time and a lot of manpower. I get tremendous amount of help from other people. Uh, I have – most people know that I am retiring at the end of uh, Tom Gammon's uh, term, and I do have a replacement. And uh, at, when I'm done, it will be 18 years, and it's quite amazing uh, uh, – that with the support of order help that I have done it for 18 years. You're almost like a Supreme Court justice. You can work and stay home. <laughs> <laughs> but you're choosing yes, to issue retire. opinions whenever he wants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I don't make the final decision. Let's get that straight. I, I, under no way does my decision count. 
You hear that, Grandmaster? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. You had mentioned the uh, Cigar Lodge. We have mentioned that a few times on here. So tell us a little bit about the Cigar Lodge, how that, how that started. Well, and, and what it, it evolved with uh, basically myself and uh, brother Russ Baker and George Nikonensky. Uh, and at Scottish Rite functions or Grand Lodge functions, we would sit outside in the evening and smoke cigars. And we would talk and just have fun. And then lo and behold, other people hey, we join you. So then we thought, you know, why don't we call ourselves a cigar lodge? Why don't we just have a, a group of guys meet? So then there's a place up uh, outside of Hamburg, Cigars International, and we go up there once a month. And it goes anywhere from 10, 12 people. I think the most we had was a meeting ago. We had 40-some brothers. When we had a quarterly meeting up at State College, we literally had 60 people outside on the terrace yeah. smoking cigars, <laughs> and they had some women there. You know, some wives came, and, and, and they sat and talked and enjoyed it. And it's a unique form of fellowship. It's it's just fun and fellowship of, of, of men that are having a good time enjoying a good cigar. And when does that happen, Ed? We normally meet up in Cigars International once a month. It's a Sunday at 2 o'clock, and uh, normally it's the third or fourth Sunday of the month we try to make it. So we call it a cigar lodge, but it's just a bunch of Masons hanging around right, being right. social. We, we have uh, asked different uh, Grand Lodge officers if, if we could get a charter, but as of yet, that we have not met the requirements. I'm not quite sure what the requirements <laughs> are, but I know we haven't met them. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's one thing when we get blown off, but, uh, you know, that's a, <laughs> when that's the a, Tyler gets blown off, uh-oh. <laughs> I have hope before I'm done as my grand Tyler that that might happen. I'm going to say I've attended uh, Cigar Lodge a couple of times, and it, it is a hoot. There's a lot of great guys up there, and and there's more there's more Masonic talk than anything else. I mean, people bring up, you know, stuff that's going on in their lodges, and, hey, I had this happen, what did you ever do, and... Somebody's always got some advice or some questions or whatever. It's really a good time. Well, the nice thing about when you get brothers get together and talk, over the years, we all have had what we felt was a unique experience in our lodge. Oh, yeah. Or in, in our Scottish Rite or Tall Cedar, and we find that it always not. And by bringing up and sharing it, we get to know how other people handled that same situation. And I think the advice and consent is a great exchange we have in a cigar lodge. Yeah, it's a good time. Well, I'll give a little secret away here. <clears throat> Last year, I was invited to the cigar picnic at the Stum residence outside of yes, you were. Holland. And it was phenomenal. It was great. The fellowship was there. The guys were great. I met district deputies from other districts throughout eastern Pennsylvania. Yep. We had a great time. It was so good, in fact. It rained like God crazy. God smote us that he, day. He, he smote us that day. <laughs> Ed had tents all over the backyard. It looked like the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, with these tents. Uh, the winds came through and totally destroyed everything. The tents were we three, pictures of three houses I mean, over. Yeah, It was unbelievable. We finally ended up in the garage until late at night. Smoking and talking. Stinking up now, Diana's the house. The only tent that was not destroyed, if you remember, Larry, was the one over the grill that we used for cooking. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but every other tent. And as far as speaking about the garage, I want to tell you a funny story. My wife is not the most happy person that I enjoy cigars. Most people know that. One Easter, around two years ago, we had Easter dinner, and my son and, and my stepson, my wife's son, Diana, uh, was going to go out, and we were going to have a cigar. And it started to rain. And John said, well, Ed, let's go in the garage. And I began laughing. I said, John, mention that to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Mom, we're going out to the garage and have a cigar since it's raining. She said, no, you're not. <laughs> he said, but Mom, it's me. It's not. It's me. She said, John, you're not smoking cigars. No one smokes cigars in the garage. So last July, when this monsoon showed up <laughs> and literally destroyed the backyard, you know, what, 20 people, what are we going to do? We got to go someplace. Now, there was four guys, if you remember, 
the only name I'm going to mention is Jeff Moyer, boo. who went in. Yeah, boo. He went in the shed <laughs> in the yeah. backyard, yeah. and yeah. he smoked there. He never came in the garage <laughs> because he knew Diana did not want us smoking in the cigar. Well, there were two other guys out there in the shed yes. with them, too. Yes, they were. Yeah. Yes, three of them were out there. <laughs> Yes, I remember that. And, but then I said to Diana, I said, Diana, what can we do? Did you get she special said, dispensation? Yeah, yeah. So she <laughs> get, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I got a special dispensation to have a cigar smoking in my garage. <laughs> so, yes, we did. But it was a fun day. It, really it was, was a great day. It, it was, was a great day. day. Yeah. It, was, it was awesome. I was wet for three days after that. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Wet oh. and cold. Oh, man. It, 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 it was, was cold. Warm. It yeah. was warm. I mean, it was supposed to be a warm day, but it was cold. Yeah, the cold, rain was coming rain. down. And we sat under that tent and downpours. Yes. But when we got up to, to talk about eating and so forth, all of a sudden, disaster struck. Now, I'm not mentioning anyone in name, <laughs> but there was two guys from Allentown. Now, remember that temperature was like in the 40s. Yeah, yeah. And they had like an hour and a half drive to get to my house. Yeah. And they came in shorts and a T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like a cigar shirt. Well, that's... No that's, rain gear. That's cold cracker No formal. sweatshirts. <laughs> nothing. Again, I'm not mentioning name, but I, I forget who Bob brought with him. <laughs> but... How do you show up in 40-degree temperature to downpour with nothing? Well, how about the guy? I'm trying to think of his, his name. He's, he's, he brought the tents. He brought the extra tents. Uh, and John, they were destroyed. Yes, John, John <laughs> Cook. John uh, Cook, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, district yes. deputy. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> the funny thing about this, I didn't tell. They were completely destroyed. So, Oh, yeah. They weren't just blown the, away. The they were destroyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the canvas tops... Two Saturdays later, we met in uh, uh, Columbia at a cigar lodge. Where else? Yeah, which I wasn't which, invited to. Yeah, oh. I, I hate to bring it up. We forgot to invite <laughs> was, Larry, who thanks, lived five Jeff minutes away. Moyer. Jeff Moyer did that. Yeah, Jeff Moyer. Oh, uh, yeah. And we, we gave him back the canvas. Now, I will say now, my son and I went out and bought a, a uh, Shed? 15 by 30 <laughs> tent. It's actually a tent that you use for as a garage to store cars in. Okay. So we're going to use it this year. But the only problem is I have no idea how to put it together. <laughs> <laughs> now, picture a frame of a, that big of a tent. Holy Larry, cow. I'm not sure how, we, but I have it. <laughs> we'll get out there Friday before. We'll get her yeah, up. Yeah, Friday before. But yeah. I will fly to your, the Masonic flag will be hanging out front again, showing yeah. that we're there. So it'll be a two-day picnic instead yeah. of a one. There one day go. to put the tent up. <laughs> Friday, yeah, Friday <laughs> evening for the tent raising, and then, yeah. yeah. And but then we're not going to take it down. <laughs> we're going to leave it there. Much to your neighbor's dismay, it'll be there all summer. I see. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back, uh, wrap up with Brother Ed, take care of the news, some other mystery segments, which we don't know what they are yet, but... Brother Josh That's will the magic of Josh. push him in there somewhere later. We'll be back. Vampires unlocked. Scary monsters and evil creatures have been a part of human creative thought forever. Symbolic of the fears common to being human, these dangerous things represent the forces that are beyond our control. One of the most popular and compelling in the entertainment and fiction industry is the vampire. Legends of vampire-like creatures have existed for millennia. Many cultures had tales of demonic creatures, blood-drinking spirits, which are perhaps precursors to the modern vampires. Many characteristics have been added to the old vampire legends by Hollywood-type entertainment industries and creative authors. Yet. As with all symbols, there are fundamental attributes which are based solidly in human history. To discover these and discard the rest, we must look at the legend of the immortal child, the history of the popes, and the wars of Transylvania and the Turks. The most famous, yet very fictitious, vampire is Dracula, whose name actually comes from a royal title in Transylvania, the Order of the Dragon, or Draco. 
This order was a group of knights responsible for protecting Transylvania from invasion and attack by their enemies, mostly the Turks. This responsibility fell on Vladimir, or Vlad the Impaler. He was descended from the Prince of Wallachia, now Romania, and was a prince of Transylvania. His job was to protect the royal family. The Turks were brutal and vicious, and Vlad met them in kind. Thus, he obtained the reputation of brutality and the nickname, the Impaler. One characteristic of vampires is blood-sucking. This legendary activity started with the popes, who believed the legend of Circassian Helen, the immortal child. They desired longevity and immortality, and sought out young boys from families with long-lived lineage. They would draw blood from the boys and inject it into the pope. Many popes died before they figured out the dangers of mixing blood types. This Vatican connection is why vampires can be repelled by a cross. The belief that victims bitten by a vampire died the living death is a result of the popes who died from injecting the wrong kind of blood into their veins. Tangled into the legend of vampires are bats, wood or silver stakes, garlic, mirrors, sunlight, and many other details which have come from creative minds, embellishing on the supernatural character of old legend. Romantic and frightening, vampires have been moneymakers in the entertainment world since Bram Stoker wrote Dracula in 1931. To discover more magical pieces of your golden key, read my book, Symbology, Hidden in Plain Sight. Next time, we will unlock the real story of King Midas of the Golden Touch. Sonic Light Podcast. This is Past Master Moyer calling in. Just finished listening to episode 67 with Tim Dedman and Josh the intern. Just a couple observations. Great addition with Tim coming on board. I think he brings a lot to the table. Uh, I highly suggest you keep the mic away from Josh the intern. He talks entirely too much. Uh, until he earns his stripes, he shouldn't be allowed to speak so much. And Tim, my BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal, would be to get rid of Larry Maris. His voice keeps getting raspier and raspier, and he gets more and more forgetful every episode. And he's just generally a pain in the you-know-what. So, anyway, enjoyed the episode. Um, I'm going to try and listen to episode 68 tomorrow. Might have some comments to make. Talk to you later. Bye. And we're back once again with uh, Ed Stum, um, the the uh, Grand Tyler of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and Masonic jurisdictions thereunto belonging. But it's just an appointed position. <laughs> don't, what was it? It's an appointed position. Don't get carried away. That's what we're saying. That's that's Ed's thing. So Ed, thank you for being with us. You got what do you got? Something else? Uh, Jack and Pete and Larry and Dave and Josh. I want to thank all of you for helping me tonight. It was not as painful as I thought it was. Uh, I survived, and uh, I think it went pretty good. You didn't get the bill yet. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't get the bill yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's great what you guys are doing, and you're getting the word out. Uh, and in a way, with the jobliness of the evening, you show how much fun you can have in our fraternity. And uh, I just enjoy it. And thank you for asking me. It was a fun night. Larry, thank you for the dinner. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, and tell your wife, I'm sure she makes great potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell her that, but your wife still makes the best. <laughs> Outstanding. All right. Well, Ed, uh, apologize to everybody at Grand Lodge for our, on our behalf, because uh, yeah, I'm will, sure we'll uh, do something to uh, annoy them at some point again. And uh, It seems to be... Monthly or bi-weekly that we annoy them? Monthly. We're, monthly. we're stretching yeah. it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're going to try to go a couple of months this time without... No, actually, it's not monthly. It's about every quarter. <laughs> it's the quarterly... Almost coincides with the quarterly <laughs> it's meeting. It's the quarterly annoyance is what it is. <laughs> but the good news is the Grandmaster loves us, so we're all right. 
Well, okay, well uh, I'll, I'll wait to get that in yeah, a sealed letter. That's, <laughs> that's still outstanding. I'm going to be in his company on uh, April 6th, so I'll, I'll probably When you out. mention our name, just tell us how hard his eyes roll. <laughs> <laughs> Because he won't speak ill of us, because he's he's too polished. No, he's for a that. gentleman. That's but a fact. the eyes may roll. Yes, <laughs> the Masonic eye roll. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, let's. I guess we should probably go to our news director. Let's go to the news desk. Good news, everyone. Masonic light news. News not fit to print. In Masonic news today, it has been reported that a 27-year-old man fell to his death while attempting to climb the outside wall of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania's magnificent Masonic Temple at 1 North Broad Street in Center City, Philadelphia. It was first thought that he may have been mugged or perhaps hit by a car, but police determined through surveillance cameras that he indeed fell from the building from an undetermined height. In a related story, the Committee on Ritual has concluded that it will no longer use the term eavesdropper. <laughs> That's the Masonic news. So mote it was. Uh, oh, okay, I get it. He, from the eaves. Oh, my goodness. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> Larry, you going to make it? Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, once again, Ed, thank you very much. But uh, thank you to our sponsors, our potential sponsor, possibly uh, Dan, Dan's painting company. We'll see if he he signs the contract. It's very lucrative. You're Uh, signing it, right? Right. Okay, uh, okay, good. We Um, have a contract. (laughs) What? No, but it sounds good on the air. It does sound good. It does. Um, But uh, you you heard a little blurb earlier uh, during the uh, commercial break. But uh, big thank you again to our Patreons. so, you folks, if you have any interest, you can always sign up for our show. We take a a one. We can do a one dollar recurring payment. That's all. Just one. One dollar. We're asking Just... a one dollar per month recurring payment. It's a a scientifically designed number that is so small that you'll forget about it. And every time you look and say, "Oh, I should stop that," you'll forget and you'll it's just let it keep going. Too annoying to discontinue the payment. So that's all we want is just fifty of you to just one dollar. One dollar. One dollar. And Less then, than a cup of coffee. And then we, <laughs> okay, Sally Struthers. <laughs> um, but, Support these itinerant masons in their quest for uh, Masonic Light. It's uh, patreon.com slash Masonic Light Podcast. So check that out. So easy. And uh, I guess we need to cue those chickens. Maybe. And chickens. A special thanks to. Effort Lodge 665 for allowing us to continue to broadcast from this beautiful palatial studio in the basement under the Pennsylvania Spirits Store. Also to our producer, Josh. Uh, Josh, the intern. We don't call him an intern anymore. He's actually the legitimate producer for always doing a great show for us. Also to uh, Jack Harley, our news director for Outstanding News. Uh, to our listeners who continue to support us, to our guest tonight, Brother Ed Stum, Grand Tyler of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, and also a shout out to our Masonic Boston Funeral Director, direct, uh, geez, our Masonic Boston Funeral Director, Hadley Newham. Hadley Newham? Had, Hadley. Hadley. Hadley Newham? Headley Lamar. <laughs> Back to Casablanca. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I'll tell you what. That's, and, and again, our law firm of uh, Dewey Cheatham and how we appreciate it. I don't have much else to say. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Um, thanks for listening. This is Larry Maris. Yes, see, Larry, you talk longer than the chickens clip. So that means you went too long. Uh, Pete Ruggieri. This is Josh. And oh, Jack. And and Jack and Dan. Thank Adam you, Dan. Ed. And and Ed. Our special guest, Ed Stum. Thanks for Ed, being with us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.